Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer and this is Strange Mosaic. And after uh, quite a lengthy hiatus, my good friend Howdy Muskoski is back with us. And this was a show we put on the board um, probably like five or six months ago. And then he went off and wrote his book, which hopefully I'll have a chance to read soon. He sent it to me. And next time we'll talk about that. But he's here today to talk about Dark City and what might be happening at night while we are sleeping. Howdy Mikoski, welcome back. Nice to see you. Yeah, thanks, Emily. It's yeah, it's been like uh, five months, six months or something. And yeah, it's been unbelievably busy on my end to get the book done. And um, now, of course, I come out of writing that, which is quite timely, given that, like we were just talking about, our world is in the next level of crazy. And uh, we have no idea what, like you say, what's going to be happening next. We, we can't possibly predict anything at this point. So it's very... Um, it's just strange. It's just really strange. Yeah. Um, you're in Norway. How's the weather there? Is it already turning into cold weather for you? Um, what is it? Uh, what's the, uh, I've noticed, at least in my reality, more attention on Norway than I've ever seen because I follow tennis and Casper Ruud has had a very successful last half of the season. And he, of course, is the uh, from Norway. But other than that, I, I don't usually hear much about Norway. What's happening over there? Well, there's also the chess champion from this country who uh, accused the uh, accused the guy of cheating against him by, I think, using anal beads and having them vibrate to tell him what sort of move. I, I kid you not, what sort of move he's supposed to make. This is like a a scandal of the chess world. So that's going on here, and um, of course, like Europe power prices right so that's really what we're going through um weather has been a, it was a mostly crappy summer but we had a good last month good enough to get the harvest done excellent harvest very very pleased with the garden and what we grew we oh, good. that's great i've still got more to do and now it's just gonna be like what a north american say what a somebody in michigan would think of as fall football weather that's kind of what yep. it's like right now Okay, I gotcha. That's interesting. I didn't realize there was a current chess champion from Norway as well. Yeah, I consider sort of tennis to be like an athletic style of chess. So the fact that they're having uh, prominence in both in both arenas is interesting. And like the, the anal beads just adds intrigue beyond belief to the story. So, <laughs> so there we go. New, but, whole new meaning okay. of playing the glass bead game, right? There. You go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that's what Hessa had in mind. <laughs> right. Michael discovered uh, last week that there's some very expensive toy called MK Ultra Beads, right, that are like some kind of fidget toys. You know what these fidget spinning toys and things like that are? And they have like yeah. a pattern and a rhythm you're supposed to do these with and and, and whatnot. And so. Um, you know, we've been playing the glass bead game for a year and a half now. And then now all of a sudden, it was, we talk a lot about, you know, sort of this is part of the programming template for MK Ultra and whatnot. And then now they've come out with the MK Ultra beads almost as like a talisman to our ideas or something. I don't know. <laughs> but they're very expensive. It's like, what are these things? Uh -huh. It's not something a person just playing with a toy would afford, right? They're very expensive. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not what Hessa was thinking, probably. Anywho, all right, well, let's get to Dark City. I um, This was a movie I missed when it first came out, right? And was just, I'd heard of it a couple times over the years, but I actually uh, watched it. I can't remember if I watched it for an, uh, an episode of Conspiracy Cocktail or a show I did with Nish or something like that about a year and a half or two years ago. Um, and I had a set of ideas about it then and then when I whenever I know I'm going to talk with you about something how I think about things doesn't necessarily change but for you elicit like a different set of analytical tools for me so I took another sort of look at it and I realized that there was all these connections that I either had maybe only made surface wise or hadn't made at all mm. that that opened up another interesting sort of part of this. And so I'm excited. I know you had sort of missed it until recently. I'm excited to hear your thoughts on it, where you went with this, and let's get the party started. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember watching part of it when I was 
younger, maybe a year or two or something after it'd been out. I caught part of it, but not all of it for some reason. I don't know why. I bumped into it again five or six years ago or so when I watched it and I realized it took me a while to catch a lot of what we're going to talk about today because to me, this is one of the greatest movies ever made for describing our reality, describing Plato's cave. Of course, it doesn't describe how to exit the cave as we will discuss as well. It's pretty standard. A lot of Plato's cave movies are good at explaining the cave but not exiting. Mm -hmm. Um. For me, this this the, the movie started to make sense when I understood this is Matrix 1. That when you realize that the Matrix that followed after this is actually Dark City, a long time in the future, that it's it's actually the same story. Um, I know that the director of Dark City likes to say that the Matrix stole his ideas. Uh, and I, I don't think it's, it's to that extent. I think the universe was trying to tell a story Dark City did poorly at the box office, so it retold it in the Matrix. But Dark City is a more clear Matrix, actually. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, the other thing that I realized uh, watching it, sort of taking a look and looking at it the second time through, is that another show that really um, uh, plays with the same ideas and maybe, I don't want to say extends them farther, but because it was a TV series that lasted for many seasons, was able to go into more explanation and sort of make some richer characters. And, you know, it, it, whenever you're dealing with the TV series as opposed to a movie, you have more time to sit with and understand the ideas before the story is over, is um, Fringe and the the observe the characters known as the Observers and and what they were doing and, and how that all played out. And I, I will bring some of that up when we get further into this. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, okay. it's like that, you know, generally people file patents for the same technologies in many countries at the same time, right? And sometimes these are people who have, are not um, publicly known people, so they wouldn't have all kinds of espionage on them yet or whatever it is. It's the universe trying to express an idea whose time has come, um, and it plays out in many ways. And yes, the fact that Dark City didn't do super well at the box office gave matrix sort of a bigger slate to work with because people hadn't seen those ideas already yeah so where, where do you want to go do you want to give because some people there'll be a lot of people that haven't seen dark city so maybe should we try to give them a short five minute overview of the movie so that if anyone else is following they can sort of get a glimpse of what we're yeah, why don't, why don't we start analyzing it maybe we should tell them what it is absolutely why don't why don't why don't you do that um, and it, because I think that uh, I I tend to get um, I get lost in my own thoughts about things. I think sometimes you're better at staying on point. Um, so why don't we do that and then we'll go from there? Okay, I've got a I've right from my book, so I've got like one paragraph. I can just read that off, and then maybe that's a decent background for everyone. Perfect. Um, the movie was written and directed by Alex Proyas. A Greek originally born in Alexandria, Egypt, but moved uh, but lived most of his life in Australia. The city, it, the movie is set in a city seemingly in the 1940s or 1950s, yet has elements of many different time frames. We find later that this is not a real city, but an artificial realm created using psychic powers by an alien race called the Strangers. The Strangers brought humans to this realm from their from our original home for an experiment. This false city is a world which they renew and change every midnight by implanting new memories and identities in the humans. This realm, we later find out, is a giant circular city floating in outer space and is always in perpetual darkness. The strangers are a dying race and they are experimenting on humans because they want to understand the human soul. They believe that by doing so, they will gain the secret to save themselves. They believe memories are somehow linked to the soul and as such, the main element of the experiments is human memory. Every night at midnight, the city is stopped and everyone is made to go to sleep. During this freeze period, new identities and memories are given to each human, which they will live out the following day. One day they live rich, the next day they live poor. This means that the humans in Dark City wake each day with another series of false memories to a character that is not really them, which will change the following day. Now, the main character we will follow in this movie is named John Murdoch. He wakes up in a bathtub in the morning, not knowing who he is, why he's there. There's a dead prostitute in the room. And the, the movie is as much of an, uh, an understanding of what Dark City is as this character is trying to figure out who is John Murdoch, 
uh, why, what is his life? What has been going on? We interact with his, with a police inspector, with his wife, with a few other people. There we go. I think that's kind of an overview of what, what we got for Dark City. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good overview. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't realize the background of the of Alex Proyas in terms of where he uh, where it's from and where he grew up and all of that kind of stuff. And actually with some of the ideas I'm going to lay down a little bit later, that that provides some interesting texture and, and sort of uh, thoughts to go along with that. Um, so when I watched this movie, my first impression was that this had to be Los Angeles. And my guess would be that for almost anybody who grew up in any kind of um, big city that has gone through a phase of like, uh, maybe some dilapidation and then re gentrification or people moving away from the city and back into the city that that they might think it's their city, right? Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, someone who I follow, who I don't know the level of his interest and the kind of information that you and I deal with, but he's an artist who um, presents a lot of the same sort of themes, ideas, or symbolism in his music and the art that goes along with it. His name is Jeff Mills. He's a techno DJ and producer from Detroit. He was involved in like doing a Dark City revival in a series of uh, DJ, DJ dance music events in various large cities around the world based on Dark City. So it's kind of like it's an every city, any city kind of idea. Um, but to me, like this uh, elicited um, a different way of understanding, but almost a one-to-one -one match of what is really happening. Um, like when I would go to the underground warehouse parties in Los Angeles overnight, right? It was almost like I would go into uh, a warehouse or a realm that didn't seem that different than their underground space. And when I came out in the morning, sometimes just before dawn, the world appeared to be almost exactly the same, but with a few minor differences, right? And I, I, this was something I noticed back, you know, early, early on then, like how strange it was that like over the course of the few hours I was in the, the party, either something about the reality changed or something about me changed to the point that nothing seemed the same. And, you know, and this was sometimes be more drastic than others, right? Sometimes you have like a, a very meaningful experience and then that is, but other times it was just very standard, maybe even a boring night party, but you could still see this when you came out that like something, something was not the same. Um, and so those were my sort of initial thoughts. And I started to think about some of the people, whether they be sort of background characters or main players in the underground dance music scene, not only in Los Angeles, but in other big cities and how they have some archetypical similarities to some of these, the strangers or some of the characters, uh, even, even the supposedly human, the human characters in the movie. And so that was kind of my filter for understanding, perceiving it, right? Was that, that it really reminded me of my late nights in, in the you know warehouses of the lapidated downtown in East Los Angeles. Um, for you, how did you, like, when you watched this, um, what was your, like, how, what was your frame for this? How did you sort of pull that from the screen into the real world? Uh, well, again, the first I found was, was how many elements that were so similar to the Matrix were in the movie. I didn't realize until I checked it out that they actually used the same sets. That Proyas, when he mm -hmm. finished shooting, um, when he finished shooting Dark City, and the Matrix, because they also filmed in Australia, right? They just took over his sets. So you will find that these building jumps, it's the same buildings. You will notice ah. that the exact same set, the same staircase is used in both of the movies. The same, ah. they come out of the same elevator. They go down the same hallway. So you've also got this very bizarre uh, interaction that I noticed between the movies right away. So it's it's so similar. And the dialogue is similar. Many of the words that there's a there's a doctor who's an important part of this movie, and he, he's very important, and even the name of him, Dr. Schreber, played by Kiefer Sutherland, he says words, lines, almost exactly to Morpheus in The Matrix. They're, they're, they're almost exactly the same words. So that was the first thing I noticed, which is how many similarities there were between the two movies. 
I noticed similarities though with other movies right, right away. I saw similarities to the Truman Show. I saw similarities to the Adjustment Bureau. I saw similarities to so many things. It's almost like without some way without knowing it, they were all influenced by Dark City. So that was the first thing I got was this this recognition that it's like this movie is one way or another is a real catalyst for all of these other what you might call reality understanding movies. Mm-hmm. That was the first, those are the first ones that came through. I think the second thing that came through right away was um, that we're dealing with memory, that memory and how much are you going to trust your memory, which is just kind of what you were just talking about, that the, does the world look the same or does it, does it not? And this idea that we trust our, how to say this, we trust our, our past is our past because we have a memory of it. And no one is contemplating that possibly the memories we have are somehow implanted in us, as is happening to these people in in Dark City. Every morning they wake up and they have completely new memories, completely new lives. Everything has been rebuilt for them. And they have no memory of the life they just lived, the lived life before that, the life before that. It's, It's kind of reincarnation, but in a really tight scale. So again, this this the the, the characters are completely lost because they don't really know. We're the opposite. We think we know everything because we have this what we believe is a is an infallible memory of our past. But that was the next thing to really start questioning: Why do I fully believe that happened in 1982, for example? Just because I have a memory of it, how do I know that's a true memory, not implanted, not false, not not I made up the, I've made up the memory? That was the, so that came clear too. Uh, the the questioning of memory. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, we see this with like the Mandela effect stuff, right? Like the argument over whether people are misremembering or whether reality has changed, right? And all the iterations in between. And I think, you know, we talk about some people have good memories, bad memories. We have an epidemic of Alzheimer's and, and dementia and things like that going on now. And then obviously people who have, been deep researchers of MK Ultra and mind control experiments are aware of the idea of like screen memories or implanted memories or having had memories sort of wiped or deleted. We talk about the wipe in between lifetimes and whatnot. Um, the other movie that I just thought of, I think the movies that you said that there were sort of connections or similarities with the other one, and it's also a Jim Carrey movie, is the movie uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the the one with the Truman Show, because there's literally like the almost like the peeling of the stage set at the beach. It's very similar with this idea with Shell Beach. So that one definitely, too. But the eternal sunshine of the spotless mm-hmm. mind was literally a team that went around, you know, altering people's memories um, based, you know, in, in, in this case, right. he wanted it. He wanted to forget the girlfriend or whatever. Right. But um, I, mean, I saw it a long time ago. So I don't remember uh, all of the details on that. Um, But yeah, I mean, I've been paying attention to a lot about um, the different states of consciousness that humans can experience in terms of sleep, anesthesia, coma, brain dead, um, and what role um, memories play in those experiences based on some some things that I'm observing for a series that I'm doing with Nish, right? And um, this gets into all kinds of uh, ideas about um, alternate timelines, alternate dimensions, um, hidden spaces and whatnot. And, um, you know, we, we are all very well aware of um, the shenanigans around, you know, deleting things from the internet, affecting how people remember things. Right. We are also aware of like the, you know, editing film and editing tape, right? Like, you know, we used to uh, have, you know, tapes and we would make mixtapes and things like that, right? And then when you can't find something to play those tapes on anymore, right? Or when they begin to dilapidate and you can't go back and listen to those recordings that you've made. But even if you can, like if you spill something on it, then a part is missing. And we never think about these things 
like in relation to our own mind, right? We just assume that like our memory is reasonably decent. Some of us have more, more belief in it than others. Uh, and, you know, we'll argue about this with our family members or friends who remember things differently. And we'll say my memory is better and you'll say your memory is better and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But there's very little attention paid to um, how the function actually works and how much it is affecting reality creation going forward. Right. Um, and also like where when we're not thinking of those memories or talking about them or focusing on them, where are they actually residing and what's being done with them? Mm. Right. Right. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I know uh, somewhere in one of Castaneda's books, he talked about that memory is actually stored in the legs. And that's uh -huh. why in, in the books that if, if you want to remember something, it's best to get up and walk around because it will get the energy flowing through the legs and you can, you can remember what you need to remember. So that was, that was an interesting yeah. point. Cause I noticed that, that it is easy to remember things when you're walking than when I'm sitting or standing or standing or just, you know, stretched out. Have you ever heard of last Thursdayism? No, uh, Michael and I did just do a show about there's no solution. The problem that well, going for a walk can't solve or at least make better. So it's interesting what you just said about Castaneda. I'm going to have to look into that, but I've not heard of last Thursday as in please enlighten me. It just, it just fits in our conversation because it's a, it's a philosophical line of thought that claims that the earth was created last Thursday and it only has the appearance of being billions of years old. It sort of comes, it comes out of a book from uh, in the early 1920s out of Bertrand Russell. He had called it the five minute hypothesis. He, he, he claimed that the, the world was recreated every five minutes, but this, evolved to become this idea that every Thursday the world gets in a sense destroyed and recreated in the course of a second and our our world has only actually been really existent for seven days um and, and there are people who who actually it's like a church now and there are people who actually follow this in and and live in a particular way based on these ideas that really they are in you're in reality for only seven days and then a new reality is born um so it's all of this stuff is, is kind of there. People are touching it in their own ways, but of course, nobody has figured out what we're dealing with exactly and, and what memory is yet. Um, and that's kind of tricky because having done a life recapitulation, which is the review of your entire life, when I did that, I realized so much of what I thought was my memories are, were not even close to what was coming up from these deeper levels. So it, it's so challenging. I think that's one of the really good pieces that Dark City right away is is presenting is this idea of your, we trust our memories. Why? Yeah. What uh, proof do we have that we should trust them? As to your the idea of last Thursdayism, this would give a whole new sort of more deep human meaning to why people look forward to Fridays so much because it would be the birth of the new world, the birth of the new earth, right? Everybody like looks forward to Fridays. We think it's because it's the last work day of the week and we get to enjoy the weekend and watch football and drink beer or whatever the fuck you like to do, right? Mm. Um, but mm. if, 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 if literally like every Friday is like the earth is reborn or you start anew or you get a fresh start on whatever, you know, kind of thing, mm. That 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 is fascinating to me. I mean, I think most people, yes. I mean, yeah, right. I think that's you know, people think of Wednesday as hump day, yes. and, and right, get over the hump because once Thursday, yeah, you know, once we get to Thursday, we know the new world is coming on Friday, and and I mean, it, we it people who study like the the resets and the four hundred year cycles and the however many years they think the thing is and whatever, it would be interesting to see if they're able to draw like one-to-one -one parallels with periods of time in that cycle with days of the week. And if it's like a member, when, um, when there's that video of Terrence McKenna explaining his ideas about the evolution of novelty. And he talks about now how yes. like um, pant, the style of hemming your pants rises and falls like the way like civilizations rose and fall in the past. So it took thousands of years for a civilization to rise and fall. It might take one season or one year for the way you wear your pants to change, but the, the sort of pattern or the rhythm is the same. It's sped up, it's gotten tighter and smaller, right? 
And so if we're now down to the point that there's a turnover every Thursday, whether it's true or not, it's kind of irrelevant. The idea is interesting to play with. That's sort of an example. And his whole evolution of novelty was based on the I Ching, right? His time wave zero theory, I think is what he called it, right? Um, so that's kind of interesting as well. I, I'm gonna have to check out this next, this last Thursday ism. Or ne- Did you say last Thursday or next Thursday? It's called okay. last last Thursday ism. Is the is the what you would Google? Yeah, it, okay. it's very bizarre. It also it also the same topic leads to because one of the big questions that comes from the movie is uh, because uh, the what happened is in the morning Murdoch is they were trying to implant him with the with a, with these I, with these memories of that he's a murderer and they they because they're they're the strangers are testing the reason they're changing human memories all the time is they want to see how humans react mm-hmm. when they get a different memory okay so when they think they're this do they do they still go ahead and follow that programming do they break the programming do they do something else but murdoch managed to break the programming didn't didn't allow the injection to happen that's another thing by the way the same as the matrix they're being injected in dark city in the forehead for the memories they're being injected in the matrix in the back for the uh, programs to teach them how to become things but anyway um so the question becomes you know is is murdoch really a murderer or is he not a murderer but it's actually not a true question because again it's he can't be a murderer one way or another because it's not really something he did or didn't do. These are just memories that would be implanted into his mind, just like Shell Beach is a memory implanted in his mind. None of it is actually really taken place. And so we are in this very difficult state of ourselves, you know, saying, I am this, I am this, because this happened in my past, uh, that defines me. If we chucked all of the past out the window, if we managed to actually drop it in some way, who are we? So much of who we think we are is, is based on what we believe our, our past to have been. And the same thing with the world. If all of that falls, what are we left with? Yeah, uh, what you just said about these implanted things just gave me an answer to a situation or I don't know if it's a problem, it's just a situation that I've been dealing with for a rather long time, now, right? And that is, it's completely not uncommon for people who are drug addicts to have drug dreams, right? And then they wake up in the morning and they think the drugs that they were having in their dreams are there. And if they're not there, then it motivates them to go get drugs and whatever, right? But it's very, wake up and you're like, where's my drugs? Even though maybe you weren't doing them before you went to bed. I've been clean from drugs for more than seven years. I have no desire to do drugs. But on a very frequent basis, I am still treated to these dreams, which do not, when I was in, doing drugs, they made me want drugs when I woke up in the morning. They don't do that anymore. I find it annoying. And I'm always curious as to how much longer I'm going to have to continue dealing with this because it doesn't, you know, it, it, it's not, I have zero in, interest in any of that anymore, right? Like there's not like some unresolved part of it or anything like that, Right. So if, if, if this is um, something that they play with, if they're literally lab concocting memories and delivering them to hmm. us while we're sleeping, right. and maybe we're perceiving that process as a dream, and the idea is, is then it will dictate what we do during that day, right? Then maybe during certain time periods or with certain people, John Murdoch, it starts to become a challenge Right. And and because it doesn't work, you know, like it was not the thing that ever led me to do drugs, or at least I don't think so. Maybe that's the first thing that ever led me to do drugs is that the idea was implanted in, in my sleep. But I've tr- I, I've been I, I, I cannot understand why I still have these dreams. But the idea that you're talking about, that these are you know ideas that they're trying to sort of concoct behavior or a life or a lifestyle. Right. And, and imprint that into somebody. Um, that's a different way of looking at this experience that I have. That's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, that's 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 an interesting share. The, the the that certain dreams would indicate how you behave the next day. Uh, like I was an alcoholic pretty much when I was in my twenties, and but I don't remember having because I never. It's not like I ever drank in the morning. It's not like I, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I never had that kind. So I I would never could say I had a dream that would influence how I would how I would uh, from that point behave toward the addiction. Um, 
But it, I, of course, we all have had dreams that when we get up from, we start behaving in a certain way. Or we have an, we have an energetic imprint, you might say, in our system. That at least that I can certainly relate to. And uh, certain, like, you have a dream of a certain person, and then for the rest of the morning, you, you can't stop thinking of them. You, you call you're them, trying or to not think yeah. of them, and it's like literally, the, and you're real, and you're starting to wonder, okay, is this just coincidence or? Right was something implanting that particular image of that person into my dream world in order to try to screw up my next day. Uh, <laughs> I'm leaning more to, of course, that, that our dream world is way more manipulated than we want to think it is that our, because of the research now with exit the cave and, and with the after death state and, and near death experience being in the astral realm, the astral realm is a realm of trickery and deception. And in a sense, in dreams, we're, we're moving into or touching the astral realm. So why wouldn't we be getting tricked in our dreams as well? It makes complete sense. Um, so that that's another thing to sort of be aware of is this sense of we try to be protected and focused in our daily life. And then we kind of forget, well, I'm going to sleep now. So I don't have to think about it anymore, but it's the, the, the protection and the awareness has to continue into the dream state. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that, I mean, I think I'm thinking now with this idea in mind of some other strange types of recurring dreams I have, right. Like, and who's involved in them and what that could mean on a, more significant level in terms of what you're talking about. So that's an interesting thing to right. let around in my mind for a bit. Um, I had mm -hmm. a couple of things as I was doing this sort of most recent recap and run through of the movie that sort of came up. I have, I've opened some uh, windows on my computer, some tabs to sort of remind me of some of these ideas. And so I wanted to maybe go over a few of them um, with you and see what you thought and see if it elicits anything else. And I'm just going to kind of go in the order I have the windows just so that I can not forget something. Um, but like I told you, they the strangers remind me of the observers in Fringe, right? So these are the observers in Fringe, right? And it's a very similar story. They are, um, you know, basically uh, able to, they're from the future and they have, you uh, created some problems for themselves based on the technology that they introduced into their bodies, right? And they're um, coming back to sort of fix it or gain some, some advantage or whatever. And there are uh, dissidents, particularly this one, with be which, who begins to sort of have a fondness for the humans of the modern time, right? And sort of doesn't want to necessarily steal from them to maintain this strange time manipulated dominance of these future observers and that sort of leads to the story unfolding as it is right um but there's a lot of similarities uh these th th these people function during the day and at night but other than that there's a lot of similarity between the observers and the strangers yeah just before you go so we don't lose this image uh, the first thing I noticed when I looked at the screen, because I've never seen this TV show before, is how much these people known as, what do you call them, observers? Yeah. Yeah. They look exactly like the people from the Adjustment Bureau, the ones who are controlling everyone's lives, who are, you know, making sure you open this door and don't open that door. I mean, it, they're, they're, they're presented and yeah. look the same. So yeah. it's, it's this idea of contro somehow controlling reality or attempting to control reality. So these, the observers, based on the tech that they introduced to their body, are able to map out time perfectly and get ahead of it. So they use coordinates to basically predict what people are going to do and be able to be there before or intercept or whatever. They can walk in and out of time based on coordinates and things like that. So they're, they're extremely advanced at mathematics, at calculations and, and ratios and proportions and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and okay. so the observers, um, this is the tech. So each one of these observers has this that has been introduced at the back of the neck, like in the similar place from the matrix, right? Mm -hmm. And at one point in the series, uh, late in the series, Peter uh, ki uh, kills one of these guys and removes it from, or I don't know if he killed him or whatever. It is. He gets one of these out of one of their bodies. And he puts it in his to see what it, this shit does. And he exists for, hard to say, timing in the TV show, somewhere between a few days and a few weeks. 
And even in that early, like just having that in him for a small amount of time, begins to lose his hair, begins to lose his humanity, begins to become very, very good at calculating coordinates, proportions, mathematics, predicting where people are going to be, getting out ahead of them. Um, and then, you know, his girlfriend convinces him to take it out and, and he goes back to his normal self, but now with the understanding of how it is that they're doing what they do, right? So it's this uh, in the back here, which looks kind of like the syringe that they were using to implant things in the, the forehead in, um, in, in, in Dark City. And, you know, hmm. also looks like things we have been warned of in terms of implants in the body and, and things like that, right? All right. Um, the, one of the most interesting things um, about this movie, of course, is Rufus Sewell. And he's someone that I've done a lot of, I've done two shows just on the career of Rufus Sewell. Um, I think that there are some actors out there, not all of them, maybe, I don't know, but a lot of them, particularly actors like Rufus Sewell, who aren't like leading men very often in big blockbusters, who tend to, you know, uh, I think that there's, when you look at the arc of the career and all the role they've played, you get a better idea of what's going on than just any individual character in any movie or show that they've been in, right? But his face in this particular movie, I'm gonna say some more about Rufus Sewell in just a second, reminds me quite a bit of the original drawing of the Night Stalker when they first started looking for him in Los Angeles, right, in the early 80s. And the hotel that he wakes up in, right, is reminds me a lot of the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, which is where Elisa Lam died. And I have something to say about that in a minute. Lots of other people have died there, but it's also where Richard Ramirez was supposedly living during a good portion of his run, right? And um, he wakes up in the bathtub there, right? So when Elisa Lam died at the Cecil Hotel, they found her body in a tank of water, right? And the way that they were able to find her body in the tank of water was that people were complaining that the shower in there, the water coming into their bathtubs and showers and sinks had a funny odor or taste to it, right? right. Um, and so this started to make me question, I mean, I have lots of questions about what was going on with the Night Stalker and you can look into like some of Dave McGowan's work and stuff around this to get maybe a more accurate picture of what was going on. But to me, this and this are like, they, they just, they bring, they bring up an energy, right? And this was a guy, Night Stalker, who went out in the middle of the night and supposedly did all of these strange things to people, right? And then sort of, you know, slept all day and then went out and did it again at night and, and whatnot. And he, it, it, it seems like there's some sort of, you know, some, some tone that, that is similar for me, right, um, about this. I'm going to take a break for a second so you can talk about the things I've said so far. And then I have a couple of more. Okay. Um, well, I remember, I, I mean, I remember we had that we, we, we did have the discussion about that hotel and I don't remember what, what video we had. And you, yeah, you told me that story. Very, it's a very strange story. It might've been when you, when you were sharing your experiences of moving to LA and then it became, I can't remember which one it was, but I remember now be bringing that up for me. What came from that first was the reminder of the, of the importance of the bathtub. Mm -hmm. And it's literally the first or almost the first seconds of dark city is him waking up in the bathtub and what's really important to, if you're watching and i highly recommend by the way go watch dark city uh, i think it's it's for you can rent it on youtube so you can you know pay three dollars and rent it there because it's very hard to find dvds or find anywhere else you can just actually rent it on youtube watch it it's it but he wakes up in the bathtub in the exact same motion as neo will wake up out of his bathtub when the when the things are pulled out the motions are exactly the same and the way he gets up the way he stands from the tub so we're seeing that uh murdoch has if you're saying that neo has, has, has somehow awakened to some new reality which of course he has 
That's what's happening to Murdoch. And in in, even though we don't understand it, that's what's happened. He is awakening to a new reality. And he first thing he does is he goes to the mirror. And the mirror is cracked, if you remember. So right away, we're seeing that he's actually seeing, in a sense, the crack in himself. Or you might say the crack of the world. He's cracked the world open. And now he is... He, he's confused as to where he is. I'm just going to give these, these first few things that came up to me. He walks out of the room and he smashes a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fishbowl breaks. The fish is not laying on the ground. He picks up the fish, supposedly showing he's not a murderer, puts it in the bathtub to save it. And if you recall, that's almost the first scene as well of uh, Moon Knight. In the first Moon Knight episode, the fishbowl breaks. The fish is laying on the ground. So we have... Again, these these connections, and I think the fishbowl is representing the bubble of reality. It's representing mm -hmm. the the closed space of reality has been in. So, if we're if you're seeing just within the first two minutes or, or so, first minute of the movie, we've seen different references to Murdoch has has awakened to a new reality. The challenge is then when you when you change that to the Matrix, because if people seem to forget this that. Morpheus tells Neo when he's trying to tell him that he's the one, that there was a one previous to him. There was one who could manipulate reality just like Neo is supposed to be able to do. And when you realize that these are the same movies over time, mm -hmm. that one that Morpheus is talking about is John Murdoch. Mm -hmm. We will find that the supposed pre-Neo is John Murdoch. But once, so once we get that and we, we can go into to the weird similarities of the Matrix, we start beginning to question which side is Morpheus and Trinity on um, for a number of different reasons. I don't want to get into that yet. I want to let you talk here. But that, that's the first thing that came up just right from the bathtub, the importance of the bathtub in Dark City and how many things are presented to us in the first minute of that movie mm -hmm. as to what John Murdoch is, who he is, and if you know the Matrix, who is who who is who he's the reference character of the original one in the matrix that's really interesting the other thing about the fish and i can't remember exactly the type of fish that it was but it the, oh, i think it was a goldfish a goldfish perfect that goes to my story yeah. perfect. so you have the the glass bowl which is like the snow globe right like very small it breaks yep. takes the fish and he puts it into the bathtub, which is also a small body of water, but significantly bigger than the fishbowl. So it's kind of symbolic of you're about to break out into this little tiny reality you've been living in. And now you get a slightly bigger one, which is still not the vast ocean or whatever, but is bigger. And then you're obviously probably aware of the idea that goldfishes have memories that reset every four seconds. Have you heard the term the goldfish memory? No. Yeah. So That's there's a term... Right. And a lot of people say it now about how at this point, you know, humans have a, you know, shorter uh, attention span than a goldfish. But this idea that the goldfish's memory resets every four seconds, which is why they're content to live in plastic bags, small bowls, all of this kind of stuff. Right. Because their memory flips over that quickly. So the term goldfish memory is like, an, you know, an idea or a meme or, or, or whatever, right? I don't, I've done some research on it many years ago. The one, first time I ever heard it was like, you know how sometimes you go to the bank or at least back in the like 80s and 90s when you would go to the bank and there was more of a human to human connection. This one teller at the bank that I went to for most of my young life or whatever, always had like a quote of the day. And one of the days it was something about a four second goldfish memory. And so I, you know, I, when the internet later one time I looked it up and some people will say it's you know 17 seconds or four minutes or whatever but the idea is it's very short so the fact that it was a goldfish being moved from the small reality to the bigger one right uh I think is is also fascinating hmm I've never heard that yeah it also made me think when you just were talking about the teller we used to have and so if you're anybody over the age of about 40 or 30, 30 or so, we had these little connections that you used to deal with on a daily basis. Like you say, you would the bank teller and you would often make sure you went to the same line in the teller to talk to whoever you knew. Our our uh, barber, hair cutter, stylist, whatever you want to call them, we, that, was, that was always a very specific um relationship that was involved there. There was there was always there was always something interesting in the conversation that would happen you kind of got to know each other somehow for from, from the, the process of cutting hair and so many things because of the internet have been gained to us but so many of these little things have been lost these interconnected 
constant little meetings that we would have for mm -hmm. small, small things that we would have to do in the course of our days. Uh, there's so many things that I can just look up on the internet now, but 20 years ago, I would have to like maybe go to that store or go talk to a friend of mine who knows this particular thing I'm interested in. Oh, yeah, yeah, you go get this here. Oh, yeah, thanks. So we have so many of these, the smaller connections that used to be a part of our day, those are missed now. Yeah, we, we, we are much more, we are much more separate than we think, because we, it just came to me when you told that story, how many of these little connections and how many, yeah, we, we've lost over the course of the change of our world. Haircuts are one of the few things we can't do online, right? No. And so it's that's one of the few relationships that remains that way. And um, this, uh, you know, there's the scene in this movie where at the barber shop is where someone's getting their their memory uh, implanted for the night, right? You remember that scene? Right. And in right. my particular case, like people have interesting relationships with their hairstylist, right? Like Laura has a certain need for a certain kind of relationship from her hairstylist. At this point, I don't, maybe based on the very long and very complicated relationship I had with the person who was the hairstylist for most of my life. And um, I have, uh, I have very conflicted feelings about this person, right? Like there's a lot of things I really love and cherish and treasure about my relationship with this person. And then there's some things that are puzzling and confusing to me. And I knew this person from the time I was six until the last time I saw her was a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I had a period where we didn't see each other and whatnot, but there's been, um, this is un she's an unusual person different, but on the same level that one might consider myself. Are you an unusual person, person compared to the average normie or NPC or whatever that we're calling them right now, right? And um, some of the things that have gone on right. when we have shared space um, could be interpreted in the hair, hairdresser scenario that was presented in in, uh, in in Dark City. And I hadn't thought about it that way before. So that's kind of, that's one of the few ongoing relationships where you spend a specific amount of time with a person on almost a set schedule every so many months or whatever it is, you're with this person for a couple mm -hmm. of hours and there's small talk. And there's usually at some point more for women probably than men because the experience is longer generally where you've gotten to this very relaxed space where you're sharing things you might otherwise not share with somebody that you only have a periodic or occasional relationship with. Right. And so there's a lot of other, right. And you're dealing with chemicals and aromas and all kinds of things that affect consciousness as well. Right. If you're in a hair salon where they're doing perming or dyeing or all of this kind of stuff. So uh, that's guy, I hadn't thought about that before, but that's kind of interesting as well. It also, it just brought up to me another question about Dark City. It's one I've never been able to answer. This is, I, I have some unanswered questions about Dark City. And one is, so many of the people in the cities we talked about, they're getting a new memory. Like we, we see them, they, they go to sleep, they get implanted a new memory. But it seems like certain characters had memories for long periods, long stretches of time. The inspector every day was the police inspector. Mm -hmm. The uh, other detective, Walensky, who had kind of figured things out, who had seen through the veil and was going a bit crazy. He was always the same. The Emma character, at least until the end of the movie, his wife was always the Emma character. So it was also this... What was the choice that these strangers were making between which humans to change and which humans not to change? Was what were they all in the experiment? Was the experiment did the experiment have different timelines for different people? Um, it's something it's something that was never answered. There's some, some things that never got answered in the movie, right? We never got it answered where the where the humans come from. We we only got answered that they were searching for the soul, the human soul, as if that would somehow solve their their dying. Here's a big one that was never answered in the movie why are all of the strangers men there was not one female stranger and that's not by accident i mean you've got they had like about 200 extras there it would have been very easy to choose one female alien stranger why is there, there, there there's one i'm going to throw out throw at you to see if you have an answer why was there not one female stranger in the movie uh, that one ba that's baffled me so there's two, there's two, a uh, couple things. So what you just said about the inspector, the detective, he's always pretty much the same, right? 
So one of the yeah. things that Dave McGowan draws attention to and that I've observed, that, right, is that the length of the career of some of these detectives who investigate serial killers or strange ritual murders are, are very long. And like, it seems like whenever one of these cases occur, even if it's like they have to come from a different area of the city or a different department, this one is called. Right. So like that, you know, where you think that like, OK, maybe the person who works that beat more common would be better to bring in to figure this out. But, you know, this could get into there being sort of in between characters like like the what's his name, the Keeper Sutherland character who are sort of, you know, tangentially working with the, the strangers or whatever, or that that they use this person mm -hmm. to sort of have a continuing narrative to hold things together, right? Also, you know, the, the, sometimes there's these interesting women who are people like lounge singers or prostitutes or whatever that seem to keep a different set of hours than regular people. And so they would be maybe harder to, to convince of the switch because they don't go to sleep at bedtime, right? And so they allow some of these characters to sort of run through in a different way. So, so that, and then the other thing is in a fringe, the observers are also all men, right? They have, um, there's a period of time where you see them, that they have women that they interact with, but they're like particular women who like, it's kind of like the Nazis wives, right? The ones that will sort of go along with the program, but they're not observers. They have hair. They're not doing all the in and out of time. There was no, female observers um, in, in Fringe. And um, they seemed, mm -hmm. you know, like they, 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 some of them were quite bothered by Olivia, who was a human with the ability to move through, move from reality to reality uh, at a sufficiently advanced level kind of differently than they did but she was the only real woman doing that in regularity in, in the show and, and it was kind of different uh, and they were off, very hostile towards her right um okay. so I, I don't know like I don't know if there's something um in in fringe like part of what's happened is they've damaged their ability to reproduce and everyone is born in, in the the lab or in a test tube later. So I don't know if they've decided that like men perpetuate this reality, but I, I don't know what it is, um, but that there is some acknowledgement of the fact that human, that they lost the ability to, to have children naturally at a certain point. It was just one of those things in the, there, like I have, well, I think I figured out quite a bit of dark city and actually because of our, because of our conversation, just so everyone knows, I, I chose to read my, a uh, little segment, my eight or 10 pages, and I'm going to put it up to my website later in the week. It's a perfect way then to link back to this conversation. Yeah. So people can know that if you go over to the, to the site, you can, I'll, I've read my whole kind of, it was also a warm up for me to make sure I was ready for this, this conversation. So you can, you can at least hear my chapter, that part of the chapter and hear what was there, because there's, there are so many parts of dark city that I understand there's parts of dark city that I don't. Yeah. And, um, um, Another one that that sort of causes me a bit of concern. We can get to the ending. Maybe we'll get to the ending in the second part of it because the, to me, the ending of Dark City is it's presented as a big hope ending, and to me, it's a hopeless ending. It's uh, it's uh, like you say, you think you're out of the cave, but you're even more in than you were before. But um, if we can take one other comment before we get to that, I, I guess it would be that people should realize if you're watching Dark Dark City, the the name of the doctor who is Dr. Schreber. That doctor is related to a specific German doctor named Dr. Daniel P. Schreber, who wrote in 1903 a book called Memories of My Nervous Illness. And in this book, he describes a mental breakdown that he was having that sent him to psychiatric hospitals for years. And the, this book has become, or at the time, became like a foundation text of psychology. It was like a foundation text that led into like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and everything we know of, of psychology going forward. And, but his discussion of what he's calling episodes in the book, the things that sent him constantly to the mental hospital are very much, I've read some of this book. It's fascinating. It's, um, 
it's this he's he's discussing or the episodes are showing him reality the the realm of god um mm. beings that he's interacting with so the question becomes first of all we know that this doctor in this book is being referenced in dark cities we know that they're, they're, they're that if you want to understand dark city you have to read the the original 1903 book but it's also questioning was the doctor really having a mental illness like was claimed at the time or was he breaking through the veil so far that when he came back with what he had seen and understood he was unable to function in a normal reality where nobody could nobody could understand what he was talking about so they labeled him insane and he just believed it so it's a very interesting also discussion about going through this book and the importance of the book and the importance of the book on dark city as, as a movie that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that book, but this is actually perfect for the, the next things I was going to ask you and, and show you about. So let's do this. Let's mm -hmm. dump the original plan and let's continue on about Dark City uh, in the patron segment, because that's just where it is. And we'll get to that other idea when the time is right, because I think it's interesting as well. Um, so let's do this. Why don't you tell people um, where they can find your book and all the things that are going on around that? And then we'll move over to the patron segment. Okay. Uh, if you go over to my very terribly named website, egyptian-wisdom-revealed.com, I'm sure Emily will put a link up there so you can easily find it. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've written Exit the Cave, Ending the Reincarnation Trap, which is the first of a two-book series. This is the foundation of this question of what is Plato's cave? Um, uh, what is the exit? What is the reincarnation cycle? What are traps? What are we dealing with in the near-death experience? Right now, it's available as a PDF file with a minimum $5 donation. A print book should be ready sometime in October, uh, assuming the world allows that, and an audio book sometime in November. And of course, my YouTube channel will be still running for now, and I'll have the uh, the segment over there where I'll be reading the my insights of Dark City can sort of incomplete. And uh, yeah, that's where you can find me and um, look into more stuff. Okay, awesome. And hopefully next time you're back, we'll be able to talk some about your book because I will have read it and you will be, it will be out and we will, we, we will do that. So as always, it's awesome guys. You can join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media, emilymoyer.locals.com or rockfin.com forward slash emilymoyer. We will see you on the other side.